The reading is taken from Acts 9, verses 18 to 31. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Hear the word of the Lord. Um, good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Good, good, good. <clears throat> you know, it's always a privilege for me to be able to share God's word, and it's the same again today. Um, what an honor, and I'm so excited to be um, talking to us this morning, looking at the life of Saul, the, 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 the radical conversion of Saul's life. Um, as we go through a quick series recap, uh, we've been going through the book of Acts, Acts season 2, what we're calling season 2. It's called season 2 because we started season 1 last year. We went into sort of a time of getting ready for, for, for Easter, or late last year, early this year, got into a time of Easter, and so now we're continuing, literally just like looking at the early church after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last week, Lesero walked us through very well um, the life of, of, of Saul before he encountered Jesus, the, the, the radical conversion of Saul, of which I want to read just two verses from that specific conversion. So in Acts 9, from verse 4, it says, Saul fell to the ground. He was on a horse. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So when we talk about the conversion of Saul, it's at that moment where he physically and literally experienced Jesus. We saw what it looked like for him to go blind. He couldn't see. He's persecuting the people of God. Jesus says, I'll show you the, the many things that you, make, that you, that you must experience, the, the suffering you must go through for my name. And so we're here, Acts chapter 9, we're picking it up from verse 18 and 19, and today we're going to be looking at the, the transformational power of the gospel of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the fact that when you encounter Jesus, you're not left the same. When you encounter Jesus, your life changes. If you allow him to transform you, it changes forevermore. Three points we'll be looking at, I think we have them up here. Firstly, encountering Jesus doesn't leave you the same. Secondly, a transformed life is a testifying life. And then we're going to ask one another the question, therefore, what is our response? In light of hearing about the, the, the impact Jesus can have in a person's life, what's our response today and right now? Let's pray this morning, church. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. Thank you for the gift of another day. Thank you for the gift of another Sunday. Thank you for... For the fact that you're a God who hears us and who speaks to us. You're not a distant God. You know everything we're going through. Scripture tells us that you know every single hair on our heads. Every follicle. That's how intimately you walk with us, Lord. That's how present you are, Father. Bless us with your presence this morning, Lord Jesus. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive from you. 
to hear specifically what you're saying to each one of us, Father. I pray that you may speak through me this morning, Lord Jesus. Be with every single word that comes out of my mouth. May it be for the glory of God and for the extension of your kingdom. Be with us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on now, praise the Lord. Um, it's always exciting when young ones, you know, respond to the gospel. By the way, you must be convicted. If a little one can respond to the gospel like that, what about you? I didn't plan that. So our first point, as we get straight into it, encountering Jesus doesn't leave you the same. The first thing we learn about this truth is you change. You are transformed. And just a note, um, in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, you'll see Saul and Paul being identified as the same person. So, so there, wasn't a, there wasn't a changing of Saul's name like we sometimes hear. The Bible says in, verse 13, in, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 9, his name was Saul, but he was also known as Paul. Saul was his Hebrew Jewish traditional name that he was given, and Paul was more of a Hellenistic Greek Greco-Roman name he was given for the day. Right? So when you hear Saul and Paul, we're talking about the same person. Okay, so the first thing we learn about encountering Jesus is that he doesn't leave you the same. And and the truth of it is that you change and you transform. Have a look at verse 20. It says from our text that once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Another version says immediately. After he experienced Jesus, immediately. I mean, it's not like immediately in the day because obviously we know that he, he, he was blind for three days. He couldn't see. God was confirming who he is. But at the moment that he did embrace Jesus as his Lord and Savior, Scripture tells us that immediately then he began to preach. He began to declare that Jesus is the Son of God. Have a look at verse 22. It speaks about again, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, the reason that this is profound is because in verse 21, the people who heard Paul preach or Saul preach, it says, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name, this name being Jesus? So basically they're saying, no man, but we know that guy. He's the one who persecutes Christians. How is he the same guy now who's telling us to come to Jesus? It's like a, you think about a sort of like it's a, it's a trap, right? Like he's been sent to, to bait people in and then to arrest them. Because have a look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, the beginning of this chapter. Meanwhile, it says, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the way of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So literally, his mandate, like he, it's, it's like knowing, knowing somebody whose who's, who's specific job function and job description is to do one thing, and he's doing the opposite thing, and you're like, wait, but that doesn't make sense. He's literally doing the opposite of what we know, know him to do. It, it, this, this concept... Um, brought a song to my mind. Um, Akuna Matata, what a wonderful phrase. Akuna Matata, it's no passing craze. It means no worries for the rest of your days. So the context of that song, it's the Lion King. Simba, in that moment, is with Timon and Pumbaa. And they're teaching him this song that says, there's no worries. It's not a big deal. The interesting thing is, before that, Simba, the moment when Rafiki presented him to the entire kingdom as the son of the king, was destined to be the next king. His entire life, he was preparing to be the king. He even sings a song, I just can't wait to be king. It's literally his his entire existence. His uncle deceives him claims that he killed his father. By the way, Disney can be dark, ne? Like some of these movies, I'm like, the themes and concepts. Nonetheless, so, so then Simba, he was on this path where he was destined to be king. He goes on an opposite path. He wants nothing to do with his kingship. He's singing Akuna Matara because he doesn't have any worries of the kingdom like he used to. Then he has this moment, this come to God moment, this come to Mufasa, this come to his dad moment where he sees him in a dream and 
He reminds him about his destiny, who he was created to be, who he's been called to be, to be a king. So do you see, he was moving in one direction. He went the complete opposite direction. He had this moment where he was challenged and he's gone back. That's such a good example of us as the children of God created to be in relationship with God, our creator. Our purpose is to be in relationship with him. Sin is introduced into the world, into that relationship. And where we were, we were going to God in one moment, we're living a life that wants nothing to do with God. Sin is taking us literally the opposite direction from God. Until we encounter Jesus and he restores that relationship. And we are then supposed to go back to our original purpose, which is being in relationship with God and living out a life in light of that. So, so, so that's sort of the imagery we have as we see the conversion of Saul, this radical conversion of Saul, where, where in his mind he was doing the right thing, persecuting people who were blaspheming against God. Jesus encountered him and said, but no, Saul, you're missing the entire point. You're missing me completely. I need you to come back to me and then, in fact, take on my mission and tell others about me. That's the transformation that we see. It's, it's going in one direction away from God and moving back to God. It's literally a complete 180. As we look at some scriptures that talk about this transformation and this transformed life, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, For those who are in Christ are a new creation. Behold, the old life is gone, the new has begun, the new has started. John 3, verse 3 to 6, this is, these are the verses just before the famous John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. Nicodemus is talking to Jesus. They're talking about salvation, basically. Being, being one with God. Nicodemus says, these miraculous things you're doing, surely you must be one, one from God, one with God. Jesus says, truly I tell you, unless you are born again, you cannot experience God. He says, he doubles down, he says, verily, truly I say to you, unless one is born of the Spirit and born through water, referring to the waters of baptism, you can't inherit eternal life. Jesus' mission was clear. We talk about being a, a gospel-centered church. We're all about the things that Jesus stood for and who he was as the Son of God. And he says, unless there is a dying of the old life that was all about you and a stepping into a new life that's all about Jesus, you won't experience eternity. In fact, you, you won't experience God. Romans 6 verse 4 reads as follows. I want to read it exactly as it is. It says, We were therefore buried with him through the baptism in death, talking about Jesus, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Within the context of God and Jesus, a new life has to do with the dying of the old life. We can't coexist with our old lives and our new lives. Have a look at the same chapter, sort of a few verses after that from verse 8 to 11. It says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The life he died, he died to sin. The life he now lives, he lives for God. When we think about a transformed life, is there a difference between how I used to live my life and how now I live my life? One was ruled by this, 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 this thing that is called sin that we experience from birth. The other experiences has to do with God, a restoration of the creation order, what you were created for. That's what we see in transformation. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul speaks about 
not being conformed to the pattern of this world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transform there is, is one of the best ways to understand this change from the old to the new. The word is metamorpho. It's where we get metamorphosis. The best example is a caterpillar. You guys know a caterpillar, right? It's a little worm, got many, many legs, walks slowly, right? What happens to a caterpillar? Gets to a point where it comes into a cocoon. And what happens? Transformation. Yes, right? <laughs> we see these butterfly. It's exactly what happens. It, 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 it goes in, in one form. That's the definition of metamorphosis. It's this singular little worm. One form goes into a cocoon and it comes out as a different form. That's metamorphosis. That's transformation. So when we think about this renewal of the mind, this, this dying to the old and stepping into the new, the, the definition is it's a change of form. It's almost this opposite experience of what you used to. That's what we see of Saul. He was never the same after encountering Jesus. You can't be the same after encountering Jesus. One must ask, did I then really experience Jesus? The biblical examples that we see about this coming to God, experiencing God and living a different life. You've got the disciples who experienced Jesus for the first time. He said, come and follow me. They left everything behind. Yes, they continued to fish. They continued to have relationships with family, but the priority was no longer the things of the world. The priorities was the things of God. Abraham left his, this, his home, his family, to go on to this mission. He was sent to. He didn't know where he was going because of his experience with God. We see the prophets, we see the kings, we see many other examples. As we bring it closer to today, there's worldviews and there's religions of the day. There are people who don't believe in Jesus. There are those who then have radical experiences. So there are those who are atheists and claim God doesn't exist. Then they encounter Jesus. Radical transformation moving from the opposite direction of away from God to towards God. We, we have uh, men and women who believe in, 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 in the Muslim faith, who are known for having radical transformations. They, they experience dreams where they see and hear Jesus. Like Saul, when we talk about radical transformation, I, I, I held this view I lived this life. Man, then I experienced someone, an entity, a being that is beyond me. Now I'm moving in one direction. There's an example. My wife was reading the book by a gentleman known as Nab Nabil Qureshi. Um, he, 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 he's now deceased, 34 years old. He died. He had cancer. But he had a long 34 years because he was raised Muslim. He said at the age of five, he could recite chapters in the book of the Quran. He wrestled and sought after God. There's Jesus mentioned as a prophet in the Quran. So he knew about Jesus, but not the same way that, that, that he's described as the son of God. So he has this Christian that he meets in university who tells him about Jesus from a Christian perspective. Jesus as the son of God. They debate. He used to be a Muslim defender, defender of his faith. And he started hearing more about this Jesus guy in a different way that's not described in the scriptures, the holy scriptures that he reads. He went on a journey. He researched more and more about this Jesus. Historical evidence he looked at. Again, I'm not, th this was a guy who was trained in a certain way for years. This was his experience. He had a dream. The reason Muslims tend to have a lot of come to Jesus moments through dreams is they ask God to speak through dreams, right? So, so in their faith, they do ask for, 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 for Allah to reveal himself in dreams. So Jesus will meet them there. He had a radical experience. He met Jesus and his life was changed forever. He became a radical Jesus follower. He became what we call a Christian apologist, one who defends the Christian faith. 
So he didn't just, I know, I embrace Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I go to work. I live my life quietly. No, no, no. He was passionate about the things of Allah and his Muslim faith. He experienced Jesus in a radical way. And now he advocated for Jesus as the Son of God. It's a, sim- it's a soul experience. And by the way, he lost everything. Because when you convert from um, being Muslim to Christianity especially, more often than not, their families turn away from them. And he talks about that in his, in his book. Name, the title of the book is In Searching for Allah, Finding Jesus. Right? Yeah. His entire family turned away from him. And he talks about how difficult of an experience it was. He lamented, Lord, did I make the right decision? But he had a radical experience with Jesus. He he believed to have seen the truth of God, who God was. And he stood firm. Another example to sort of, again, contextualize it for our common, uh, sort of our our contemporary day. I was exposed in the past 18 months to to a Christian business network. So it's a network of Christian business people. So people there who, who live lives and, and, and they say they're here to glorify God in everything that they do. There's this one older gentleman, um, billionaire in South Africa, who I never personally met him. In this network, he shares his testimony. He was involved with like a number of companies that are worth sort of billions in the country. And he says God convicted him one day as he grew in maturity in his faith to give a little over 10% of what he owned to the things of God, to the nonprofit space. I know, so he keeps working, keeps working, keeps working. Years later, now he's encountering Jesus regularly. He's growing in his faith, in his maturity, in his walk with God. He gets to a point where he's convicted to give away up to 70% of his wealth. If we're using a random number, if if he's worth a billion rand, he's given away 700 million rand. And so, in this capitalistic environment, his peers didn't understand, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to experience God. I experienced the one who made me, who came to restore my relationship with him. And I'm here on a new mission. It was all about the bottom line. Now it's about the kingdom. And he's gone on to inspire more men and women like him who say, I want to do things differently. I want to be a different business owner. How does Christ impact everything I do? From how well I pay my employees to the kind of work culture they experience. You see, because when you encounter Jesus, you're never left the same. You can't be left the same. The last example I want to give is myself. I'm 34 years old. I turn 35 in a few months. I committed my life to Jesus at 15 years old. I thought about that this week. I'm like, dude, I've been following Jesus for 20 years. I remember as a 15-year-old, I didn't have a radical experience like Saul or some of the other people that I mentioned. Mine was, I prayed with my mother. She told me about Jesus. She forced me to go to church every Sunday. And one day I was like, mom, this Jesus that we're talking about, I want to know him more. I want to own my faith. And though it didn't appear a radical transformation from the uh, the understanding I had, God radically changed my heart. Because practically, I stopped living for myself more and more. Practically, I remember as a teenager, I was conscious of the people around me. I was conscious of what was going on outside of my life. And as we grow in our, in our maturity and in our faith, we think about the transformation that we do experience. Where now, the words I speak, I must double check to say, hey, would Jesus talk like that? Remember those bracelets, WWJD, what did Jesus do? Like I, like, I find myself, I'm like, hey, Jesus wouldn't have said that to, to, to a spouse. Like I literally got to a point where uh, more and more as I've gotten older, And I realize encountering Jesus can't leave us the same. (laughs) It's extreme radical experiences or it's day to day. 
Secondly, a transformed life is a testifying life. Again, we see from Saul, his life was radically changed. The other part of it then is also we understand, so, 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 so transformed life is a testifying life, but there's another thing that is important to note as we see from the text. Have a look at verse 21 from our teaching text. It says, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the one who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called on his name? Have a look at verse 26 as well. It says, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he, he was really a disciple. Verse 23 to 25, we then also note that there were those who tried to, to kill him and persecute him. But as we look at verses 21 and 26, we learn something else. And that's that there are consequences and challenges that come with a transformed life. Consequences and challenges, two slightly different things. Your old life comes with consequences. It's important to say that. We sometimes assume coming to Jesus means, hey, I'll, I'll never struggle with alcohol means if I used to have road rage on the road, the day I commit my life to Jesus, it's gone forever. Unfortunately, there are things that come with the old life that take time. We see this here. Transformation doesn't automatically erase the old life. So Saul can't sit down and say, Lord, but I, I gave my life to you. Why don't they trust me? No, they don't trust you because they saw you killing other Christians. Like you can't expect them to have the, just because you have a come to Jesus moment, you can't expect them to automatically, it comes with consequences. We ask God that we make, may we come to Jesus sooner rather than later so that our consequences are not so severe and so dire. And we see this in scripture. There were consequences for David when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then when he tried to scheme around and make it work, he eventually commissioned for Uriah to be killed. There were consequences after that. We look at Joseph and, and him being thrown away by his brothers. Yes, Joseph forgave them all those years later, but there were practical consequences. D Joseph was thrown into slavery. His life was no longer his own in the moment. For years, he went on a path simply because of the decision, decisions of his brothers. There are consequences. And it's important for us to, to understand as we enter this life with Jesus to say, one, one, one pastoral mentor once said to me, decades later, your decisions that you made decades ago may still have repercussions. It's, 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 it's part of God giving us free will. part of God allowing us to make our own decisions as, as independent entities. But there are implications. And we ask God to walk. And I'm saying this so that we don't, we don't have a misunderstanding of the gospel and experiencing Jesus. It comes with stuff. Some as a result of our own actions and then others, as we'll see now, as a result of simply living this life. So, so then we also see, so, so there's consequences on the one hand and then there's challenges on the other hand. As we have a look then at, um, specifically then at verses 23 and 29, have a look at what the text says. So then it says, after many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. Verse 29, it goes on to say, he talked and debated with the Gracian Jews, but they tried to kill him. So those were not as a result of necessarily his old life, but those were as a result of just being a Christian. There's persecution. There are people who will dislike you the moment you say you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
It has nothing to do, and Jesus said it. They'll hate you because they hated me. It has nothing to do with you personally. There are challenges that will come with following Jesus, as we, we see with Saul, and he navigated those. Now we come into then, uh, as, as, as we then start to draw to conclude, a transformed life is a testifying life. Verse 27, have a look at what verse 27 says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. A transformed life will be a testimony of who God is and what he has done. Acts chapter 9 and the remainder of the book of Acts, we see this. Paul's life testified. When, I ask, when we ask the question of the day for today, what are you known for? How you answer that question, and and it was light, so we wanted to hear the fun things. Like, what are you known for? But if if we were to go deeper with that question, at the end of the day, when it comes to the moment where Jesus returns, and, and it's judgment day, the entirety of your life, what was it known for? How would you answer that? For those of us who claim we've encountered Jesus, Did that translate? Or was it a nice to have? I wear a cross and it looks very cool. But how I live day to day, eh, my life is the same as it used to be. Paul was able to say these words at the end of his journey. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Listen to at the end of his journey. Listen to what he has to say to Timothy. From 2 Timothy 4 verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. If we look at the end of Paul's life, and we look at this text that we're looking at right now, can you see he was able to be consistent in his journey? What started off with him saying, I was known for persecuting Christians. Passionately and zealously. I encountered Jesus. And by the way, Jesus doesn't hold it against you for having a prior life before him. The Bible says he forgives our sins. So you'll notice with Paul, he lived a life before him. He was rebuked by Jesus. And he did respond by accepting Jesus. And then the remainder of his life, He was known as that radical, crazy Christian. That guy who always talked about Jesus. Left, right, and sinned. I had a friend in grade 11. I told you I got, I I, I committed my my, my life to Jesus when I was 15. That was grade 9. In grade 11, I had this friend, guys, who talked about Jesus all the time. I said, my guy, I love God, but can you, can you, whoa, can you, Anya, just a little, can you stop just a bit? I was the, the, the immature, less mature version of myself. Because I desired to be like Paul. Who is able to say, follow me as I follow Jesus. For my entire life is about God. It's not to say we don't love our family. It's not to say we don't prioritize our kids. It's not to say you don't excel at work. You do. But live as one who has Jesus inside them. Show Jesus wherever you are. That's what we learn. That's what we see. As we look at the life of Paul. We see then in verse 27, this life of testimony was firstly with those internally. So Barnabas was able to say, no guys, I can vouch for him. I've seen him personally. So internally your life should testify. My wife should be the first person to say, hey, Morandini loves Jesus. He treats me the way it's described in the Bible. He doesn't just preach it from the pulpit. 
We, we should have our kids talk about Sinaba as a godly mom. She prays for the church. Man, but she prays for us too in the house. You pray for the kids in the house, I get to assume. I'm confident because I've, I've been around you. We, we, the lives we live internally, the, the people closest to us must be the first to testify. This person has experienced Jesus. And then secondly, we, as we see in verse 21, the people were astonished. But he's living a different life. So our, our life should testify internally, but it should also testify externally. So people who don't know us should say, no, but there's something different about this guy. He looks at me in, in the eyes when he talks to me. He asks for my name. She asks me how my family is doing. Church, being a Christian and being transformed by Jesus is not just a Sunday thing. It's not just a Bible study thing. It must infiltrate and overflow into every aspect of our lives. So what does your life testify to? Does it testify about God? What does it testify about you? The things you love, the things you desire, <laughs> your sports teams. Are you known purely for just how amazing your baking is? Which can be a great thing. I, I'm very passionate about the things I believe in. I'm passionate about Jesus. But I'm also passionate about Kaiser Chiefs. I'm a passionate guy. But I should never be known more for being that Kaiser Chiefs follower than I am for being a Jesus follower. What am I known for? What are you always talking about? What do you get excited about when you talk to your spouse, when you talk to your best friend? Do you ever get excited about the things of God? Have your friends ever heard you talk about the prayer that you prayed or the verse that you read? Is it only ever a TV show that I watched, a game that we saw? When you experience Jesus, your life should never be the same. And so, our final question, what's your response? We're done, church. My question to you is, what's your response? In light of all of this, <laughs> what is your response? And I don't ask you a question that God hasn't asked me first. What's my response? Two questions I want to ask us this morning then that fall under the umbrella of what's your response. Has the gospel of Jesus ever transformed you? For some of us this morning, we need to ask that. Have you ever had that transformative experience of Jesus Christ? We've got Christians who've been in the church for decades, but their lives have looked exactly the same. They haven't encountered Jesus. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they knew the law. They were spending time in the temple daily and they were far from him. So for some of us, I must ask that question. I had to ask that question. I can put up my hand and say, I know, but Jesus, I've experienced you. So that's, that's me. But that wasn't always my answer. There was a point where I hadn't experienced him. And so I ask us this morning, have you actually ever experienced the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus? That's for you to answer. Don't answer it to me. That's for you to answer to yourself and to have a moment with God. And the second question that I want to ask. Some of us who can say, I yeah, know, but Lord, I have had a transformative experience of the power of the gospel. My question to you, 
and myself is, is the gospel of Jesus still transforming me? Is the gospel of Jesus still transforming me? As we speak right now, <laughs> right now, don't go far and look back and here. Can you look God in the eye and say, I ah, know, Lord, the life I'm living today, I was transformed by the power of your gospel. Because, by the way, salvation is not a one time experience. It's not a, a once off way. My, my name is in the book of life. I did it. My name is there. We need to experience Jesus daily. It's hard work. Just like any relationship, you don't put in all your, your hard work once and then you're done. You work at your relationships. You work at being a good husband. You work at being a good friend. You work at being a good child, a good sibling. Why would it be different with Jesus? He's a God of relationship. And so, may we be in a position where we are challenged daily. We need to take stock every day, unfortunately. <laughs> it's hard work to be in a relationship with Jesus. To do it the way we've been called to. Because the Bible tells us that there are limitations to us as people. But the Spirit of God is there to help us to accomplish the impossible. So as we close this morning, are you happy with your old life? With your current life? Are you living the kind of life where you are that statistic where when you, as soon as you leave the church gates and a taxi cuts in, you say things that you wouldn't say right now in church. Are you the kind of Christian who you're living the kind of life where Jesus has transformed your life, but he hasn't transformed your life. You've never forgiven your parent who hurt you when you were a child. So you're living, harboring hurt. And Jesus says, I'm here to transform. I love every part of you. I, I want to spread into every part of your life. Where is your life? Because Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. He's a father who says, come. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm here. What's your response to the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus? Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, Lord, to thank you for your word. <coughs> You are a God who convicts us. But you convict us because you love us. For the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but you, Jesus, have come to give us life and life in abundance. May we experience the transforming power of your gospel, Lord Jesus, daily. May you be with us daily <laughs> for the next few days, for the next few weeks, for the next few years, for the next few years, for the next few decades. May we be transformed by the power of your gospel as we, we learn from the life of Saul. His life before encountering Jesus and his life after. 
Show us what it looks like for us, for me, Morendeni. Our lives are not all supposed to look like Saul's life. Show us what our lives should look like. Show us what a radical, transformed life for Morendeni looks like today. Show us for each of us what that looks like. So I pray for the congregation. Continue to stir the hearts of your people. Continue to convict them. Where those that are sitting and this message is so uncomfortable, meet them there, Lord Jesus. Where they are so convicted, meet them there, Lord Jesus. May we all respond to the transformational power of the gospel of Jesus as husbands, as wives, as parents, as siblings, as grandparents, as friends, as employers, as employees, as colleagues. May you overflow into our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say,